Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to bid you a warm welcome to the 54th annual meeting of the Asian Development Bank's virtual tax meeting. My name is Hui Min and I'm from the Inland Revenue Authority of Singapore. It is my pleasure to be your moderator for this event. Today is a significant event as we witness the official launch of the Asia Pacific Tax Hub. The formation of the Asia Pacific Tax Hub was first announced by ADB's President Masasugu Asakawa at the 53rd annual meeting last year. We are therefore gathered virtually today with high-level officials from development partners and ADB member countries to witness the event. This tax webinar is divided into four sessions. Our panel discussions will examine key topics identified as the three foundational building blocks of the Asia-Pacific Tax Hub. First, the macroeconomic outlook and the role of revenue mobilization and effectiveness of medium-term revenue strategies. Second, the automation of tax administration and third, international tax cooperation. Before we begin our panel discussions, it is my privilege to present to you a video message by the esteemed Mr. Taro Aso. Mr. Aso is the governor for Japan ADB. Our audience would also know that Mr. Aso is the deputy prime minister, the minister of finance, and Minister of State for Financial Services in Japan. Mr. Aso previously served as Prime Minister, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister for Internal Affairs and Communications, and Minister of State, Economic and Fiscal Policy of Japan. Let us hear the message from Mr. Aso. President Asako, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to make the opening remarks. I would like to congratulate on the establishment of the Asia Pacific Tax Hub and also welcome the progress of President Asaka's vision and action plan. The global economic outlook has been improving, supported by a strong fiscal and monetary policy in many countries. However, the COVID pandemic has a big negative impact on our fiscal coffers. Asia-Pacific developing countries are no exception. Many of them have also been characterized by low tax revenue to GDP ratios. This means that domestic resource mobilization, or DRM, is particularly important for Asia-Pacific countries. The newly established Asia-Pacific tax hub will play a key role to maximum the DRM effort and facilitate the cooperation in the region. The ADB has long cooperative relationships with IMF, the World Bank, and the OECD. I strongly expect that this new regional hub will contribute to strategic dialogue knowledge, sharing, and cooperative technical assistance delivery in the region. I would like to point out the three things. First, strengthening DRM. We need a tailored medium-term tax reform strategy. Tax reform should be designed to reflect a specific socio-economic background of each country. Getting political buy-in is also important for a successful tax reform. In this respect, the regional hub will play an important role to facilitating the member countries' higher-level engagement in developing tax reform strategies. Second, the need of the digital transformation in tax administration has been highlighted under the pandemic. The ADB can greatly help make a roadmap for digitalization of tax administration based on each member's needs. Third, I underscore the importance of the participation in international tax framework. The landscape surrounding in the international tax rule has been changing dramatically in recent years. In order to thrive in the highly globalized and digitalized age, Modernizing tax system as well as tax administration can't be left aside. I strongly hope that the ADB 
will deepen its collaboration with the OECD and encourage more Asia Pacific countries to join the inclusive framework on BEPS. Finally, I have a particular interest in the international tax issues. At the inception of the BEPS project, I raised this issue on the table of the G7 finance minister at Buckinghamshire in 2013. As you may know, President Asaka made a significant contribution to the BEPS project as the chairman of the Committee of Fiscal Affairs of the OECD from the very beginning. I can assure you that Japan will continue to contribute to collective effort in the area of tax cooperation. I strongly hope that you have constructed a fruitful discussion today on the important tax hub. Thank you. We thank Mr. Aso for setting out his vision for ADB in helping countries tailor medium-term tax reform strategy, helping tax administrations develop their roadmap in digitalization, and to promote participation in the international tax framework. We also thank Mr. Aso for articulating Japan's continued commitment to champion efforts in these areas. We now come to session one, where I have the privilege to introduce to you Mr. Masasuku Asakawa, President of Asian Development Bank and the Chairperson of ADB's Board of Directors. President Masa, as he is affectionately known by many, will present to you his vision for Asia-Pacific Tax Hub, the rationale for its establishment, its key objectives, main operational features as well. President Masa has a very rich professional career that spans nearly four decades in diverse fields such as international finance, development and taxation in the Japan Ministry of Finance and international tax organizations as well, including the OECD and IMF. In fact, I have had the pleasure of meeting President Masa at OECD meetings in the past, during which he was the highly regarded chair of the CFA for five years. Without further delay, let us welcome President Masa. Over to you, President Masa. Thank you. Thank you, Fumin, uh, for your very generous introduction of myself. Uh, okay, uh, Governor Aso, uh, thank you so much for introducing uh, this uh, extremely important topic and framing uh, the course of our discussions. Uh, let me also extend my appreciation to our panelists and Fumin uh, for facilitating today's session. <laughs> Uh, I hope I'm, sh I'm sharing uh, with you my uh, PowerPoint presentation. So uh, uh, page two, please. Okay, uh, let me begin by posing a question. Why does domestic resource mobilization, DRM, matter? Especially when the entire world is still grappling with recurrent wave of the pandemic and desperately trying to secure safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines. While I am sure we will see a clear answer to the question through the dialogue in this seminar, I want to present two main reasons <coughs> to show why domestic resource mobilization, DRM, has emerged as a major strategic priority for our developing member countries or DMCs at this moment. The first is the need to address debt sustainability, and the, the other is to achieve Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. Uh, page three, please. Let me start uh, with debt sustainability. As we all know, uh, the COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated existing structural challenges in public finance. Unanticipated increases in public debt as a result of large scale fiscal measures to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 and shrinking tax revenues during the pandemic have obviously worsened the fiscal balance and substantially increased public debt in many of our DMCs. Page four, please. We have to note uh, that even before the pandemic, most of our DMCs recorded a weak revenue performance. As you can see here, tax yields across developing Asia are still on average substantially lower than in OECD countries. Next slide, please. So 
tax yield have also been unstable and unpredictable. Uh, the tax to GDP ratio in some DMCs, developing member countries of ADB, such as Indonesia, remain below the 15% benchmark, widely regarded as the minimum level for sustainable growth. Tax revenues in countries that depend heavily on natural resources, such as Papua New Guinea and Mongolia, show a large degree of uh, variability across time, reflecting volatility in international commodities markets. In other countries, like Vietnam, tax revenues decreased sharply between uh, 2012 and 20, uh, 2015 due to corporate income and tariff reductions, tax exemption and incentives, and declining oil revenues. Uh, page six, please. These examples demonstrate the importance of careful revenue management and attention to underlying vulnerabilities. These issues require strong attention now because government need to secure sufficient financial resources to contain the spread of COVID-19, procure safe and effective vaccines, and get the economy back to a sustainable recovery track without losing market confidence. In this regard, uh, we have to be mindful uh, that with gradual hikes in interest rates expected in the US, DMCs uh, with a large share of US dollar denominated bonds face additional vulnerability. Lower income countries also need to improve their public financial management to ensure that sustainability to maintain access their principal sources of external financing, concessional loans, and grants from development financial institutions, including ADB. Uh, page seven, please. Achieving the SDGs is a second key reason why DMCs must prioritize DRM. As this chart indicates, the region is falling short on all 17 SDGs. Here, I'd like to stress that DRM is a target of itself under SDG 17. In addition to providing a source of direct financing more generally, tax policy offers governments the tools to achieve specific goals under the SDGs. For example, you can better address income inequality through progressive taxes and promote a green recovery through, through carbon tax or other environmental taxes. Investing in innovative digital technologies such as ICT can modernize tax policy and administration and enhance revenue collection. With this in mind, I'd like to touch on two key areas that will enable the region to strengthen DRM. A page eight, please. First, uh, fiscal normalization should be carefully calibrated and implemented in a phased manner. While many of our DMCs may be considering reducing fiscal stimulus this year, countries should bear in mind the lessons from premature <laughs> fiscal consolidation right after the global financial crisis. Uh, next, page nine, please. At the same time, our DMC can already begin uh, their preparatory work uh, to address their underlying public finance vulnerabilities through strategic dialogue, careful analysis, and knowledge sharing. On the tax policy side, this includes addressing the disproportionate reliance on narrow sources of revenue, a lack of progressivity, limited efforts to tap environment and subnational taxation, and excessive and sometimes unaccountable tax expenditure measures. On the tax administration side, addressing the large size of the informal economy is a common challenge for many DMCs. We can also start joint analysis and knowledge sharing on how to enhance capacity to monitor taxpayers and make tax administrations more efficient with effective digital tools. Uh, page 10, please. Second, at a time when governments must explore ways to increase tax revenues, they also need to build and maintain public trust by demonstrating that tax burdens are distributed fairly and equally. International Tax Cooperation, or ITC, can play a role here. 
DMCs in the Asia and Pacific region can work together to close the tax loopholes routinely exploited uh, by aggressive tax planning and to combat tax evasion facilitated by an increasingly interconnected global financial network. A multilateral consensus-based solution will also be needed to tackle the tax challenges created by a digitalized economy. So, ITC is particularly relevant for our DMCs. As the pandemic recedes, we can expect increased investments from multinational corporations, given the large population and vibrant markets in the region. Our DMC should not let those companies shift profits to jurisdictions where they can minimize the tax burden. Regrettably, my friends, international cooperation on tax issues in this region is still lagging. More than half of our DMCs are still not participating in the inclusive framework on base erosion and profit shifting. The rate of participation in the global forum on transparency and exchange of information for tax purposes also shows room for improvement. This lack of engagement in ITC may lead to more unilateral tax measures, increasing the occurrence of double taxation and undermining cross-border trade and investments. To strengthen international tax cooperation, we need to be aware that the lack of pan-regional tax community has been a unique and significant shortcoming for Asia and the Pacific. To address this, I'd like to announce today the official launch of the, of the Asia Pacific Tax Hub. Uh, page 11, please. This new tax hub uh, will serve as an open and inclusive platform for strategic policy dialogue, knowledge sharing, and development coordination among our members, development partners, and ADB. ADB recently approved a technical assistance program to establish a secretariat and to develop a web portal. These activities will serve as entry point and a facilitator for engagement between DMCs and development partners as we work towards the first high-level conference under the tax hub later this year. In parallel, ADB will ramp up its operational support for DLM and ITC. <coughs> Distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies, and gentlemen, I do believe our dialogue today will provide solid building blocks for the tax hub. I look forward uh, to the panel discussions hereafter, focusing on three important issues. First, a medium-term revenue strategy. Second, a roadmap for the automation of tax administrations. And third, proactive participation in international tax initiatives. Let me thank you once again for your attention as we work together to ensure sustainable public finances for our DMCs and steady progress toward achieving the SDGs. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, President Massa, for giving us a strong and sobering message on the strategic imperative for domestic resource mobilization. You have mapped out ADB's vision for the Asia-Pacific Tax Hub, outlined the role of the hub, and also issued a call to action that countries should reflect on. Thank you again, President Massa. We now move on to our second session, where I'm pleased to introduce to you our two panelists. Our first panelist, Ms. Catherine Bayer, is the Assistant Director in IMF's Fiscal Affairs Department. She has worked in the tax field for more than 30 years, and she now manages the division which provides technical assistance in tax and customs administration to more than 80 IMF member countries in the Western Hemisphere, Sub-Saharan Sub Africa. And during her career at the IMF, she has helped design and implement tax and customs reforms in Africa, Asia, Central Asia, Europe and Latin America and the Caribbean, including in crisis countries. On the same panel, we also have Ms. Pensuk Sanka Suban. She is the first director of International Tax Affairs Center of the Revenue Department of Thailand. She oversees Thailand's implementation of international standards in relation to the Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information and the Inclusive Framework on BEPS, as well as Thailand's policy on 
international tax developments, including taxation of the digital economy. Starting with Ms. Bayer. Ms. Bayer, can you please share your insights with us on the macroeconomic outlook and the role of revenue mobilization? Particularly pertinent is the context of mitigating risk from domestic imbalances posed by spending needs arising from the pandemic. Also, what are your thoughts on the stimulus measures adopted by countries in Asia and the Pacific region? Over to you, Ms. Bayer. Min, thank you very much for that very nice introduction. Let me start sharing my presentation with you. Next slide, please. Let me present a very aggregate fiscal story for the region, recognizing that it hides significant variation across countries. As you can see in the left-hand panel, the pandemic has led to large fiscal support in Asia Pacific in the aggregate, with a sharp widening of deficits. This is especially the case for emerging market economies with deficits more than 10%, which typically <coughs> have much more fiscal space than low income countries. This has also led, as you can see in the right hand graph, to a sharp increase in government debt. Again, especially for emerging market economies with debt levels as a group approaching 70%. Such a large scale fiscal support has been necessary and desirable and continued policy support remains critical until the pandemic shocks are well contained. When the pandemic recedes, broad lifelines should be phased out gradually and future support should be geared to achieve the reallocation of resources toward a new dynamic, especially green and digital sectors. But even now, policymakers need to be attentive to anchoring public debt in credible medium-term frameworks, especially where fiscal space and buffers have been eroded. As these graphs show, substantial fiscal consolidation is required to stabilize debt in aggregate, especially for emerging market economies, though of course, this will vary across individual countries. Next slide, please. Part of this consolidation will come as exceptional spending measures are unwound and the pandemic recedes, especially in emerging market economies. But this will take time and there is also a need for higher spending to prevent scarring, increase investment and support key social areas such as health. Thus, there is a pressing need to increase tax revenue in the region as a whole, as President Massa has very well pointed out. Emerging market economies in Asia collect on average less tax revenue than any other region in the world. Low income economies in Asia collect the same as the global average for low income economies, but much less than those in Latin America. Thus, there is both the need and the scope to increase tax revenue in the region. Which brings me to how to do this. Next slide, please. From a tax policy design perspective, much of the focus will be on raising revenue after the pandemic has sub mm -hmm. have subdued in a way that is consistent with inclusive growth. So what do I mean by inclusive growth? Well, by inclusive, I mean taxes that bear more heavily on individuals with more income or wealth. This will be particularly important because the economic shock from the pandemic has been felt unevenly across households with low income individuals livelihoods being disproportionately affected compared to higher income individuals. Inclusiveness can also have other dimensions like ensuring equal treatment across genders. Growth promotion refers to designing reforms that minimize distortions that taxes may have on economic decisions related to factors like investment, employment, savings, and consumption. Next slide, please. So how does tax policy design matter for achieving inclusive growth in the recovery period after the pandemic? Well, it will matter through various channels, one of which is the tax level. Our empirical estimates have found a tipping point at around 15% of GDP below which countries experience a significant drop in economic growth. This is what you see on the left-hand chart. Another channel through which tax policy design will affect inclusive growth is the tax mix. 
it is important to recognize that there will often be trade-offs between equity and growth, with the taxes often ranked as the most harmful to growth, like income taxes, being those that are most helpful in achieving income redistribution. Be it as it may, improving the specific design of each of these taxes can still go a long way to promoting inclusive growth while at the same time raising much needed tax revenue. This is an area where we did a lot of work recently and I would invite those interested in the topic to consult a note published as part of our special series of fiscal policy issues related to COVID-19. Next slide, please. Now, turning to the role of revenue administration in this process of recovery and rebuilding tax capacity. As much as possible, countries should maintain or restore pre-pandemic compliance levels. To do so, the focus should be on several aspects. First, industries that are not significantly, significantly affected by COVID-19. That's to say, winners from the pandemic in sectors such as digital sectors, telecommunications. Second, the focus should be on taxes where frequent remittances are required, such as VAT, GST, and pay as you earn. Key revenue streams should also be a focus in helping taxpayers to ensure their filing and payment obligations remain up to date. Of course, there should be tailored approaches to managing collectible arrears and tax returns. As President Massa also mentioned, there should, to facilitate compliance, there should also be greater reliance on digital processes, tools, and communication. It will be important to make revenue administrations more inclusive, including for women at the management level and designing policies that will help increase women's participation in the labor force. Establishing medium-term revenue strategies, which I will talk about uh, next, can help build a social contract and align revenue recovery with financing economic and social development. And of course, if they have not done so, revenue administrations should improve their IT systems. As you can see at the bottom of the slide, we also encourage you to refer to the IMF's five COVID-19 guidance notes that cover different aspects of tax and customs administration. Next slide, please. There are some key areas of focus to help countries build back their revenue administration better and strengthen their tax capacity. An important one is medium-term revenue strategies. This approach helps break the focus on short-term tax reforms and emphasizes how the tax system helps social and economic development. It is an approach that combines tax policy, tax administration, and legal reforms to have a unified package to help countries re reach a previously defined revenue objective. In the region, Papua New Guinea is implementing its medium-term revenue strategy from 2017. Indonesia, Laos, Mongolia, Myanmar, Thailand, and some Pacific Island countries are also considering MTRS. Donor collaboration to support the MTRS is critical to sequence technical assistance and help finance the reforms. A second aspect mentioned previously is digitalization. Automated tax administrations maintained business continuity and revenue flows more easily during the pandemic. Nationwide tax systems integrated across all taxes enable e-filing and payment, information exchange for compliance management, especially between the tax and customs administration, information dissemination and taxpayer education. But be careful, it takes IT systems take two to three years to implement and usually need strong donor coordination and collaboration. It is also best when they are designed in close integration with overall tax and customs administration reform strategies. Third, international tax cooperation will continue to be key. 
At the fund, we are focusing increasingly on building capacity to manage international tax risks and on information exchange. The Fiscal Affairs Department is piloting a framework for building capacity in revenue administrations to manage international tax risks, and Malaysia and the Maldives are two pilot countries. Finally, building <coughs> tax capacity is a long-term endeavor. The MTRS approach and its emphasis on how tax reform can generate revenue to finance critical expenditure will help countries build back better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bayer, for sharing with us your presentation that touched on the macro views on revenue and expenditure, as well as the role of our tax policies in post-pandemic environment, in particular with your emphasis on tax policy design and in how they should achieve inclusive growth, as well as the focal areas for revenue administration. And that is where we are beginning to see the convergence of ideas on certain very key themes. If I may now invite Director Sangha Suban, where we would like to hear from her about Thailand's experience in developing and implementing the medium-term revenue strategy. Over to you, Director Sangha Suban. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Ms. Wemen Tinsher, and good evening, Thailand's time. Um, Thailand would like, first of all, to congratulate ADB for launching this event, which um, I'm certain will be greatly beneficial um, especially in the areas of regional tax cooperation and domestic resource mobilization. Next slide, please. Um, with respect to MTRS, um, we can say that uh, I may have provided technical assistance and undertook a project study for Thailand in the year 2018. And I may have indicated that we need a revenue yield increase and to have a goal to increase to tax to GDP ratio which I may have suggested a 3% increase point in five years. And that is tax policy reform will contribute 1.8% and tax administration reform 1.2%. And it does give us a large consolidated picture and a comprehensive strategy for increasing tax revenues over the medium term and aligns tax policy, revenue administration and legal reforms. But one challenge in implementing MTRS would be the political buy-in towards tax reform, uh, which is the third component of MTRS. And having said that, the Ministry of Finance has set up tax reform committee and the Revenue Department has also um, set up um, a tax policy committee to uh, study and propose tax policy measures. And the Ministry of Finance is now joining hands with ADB to look into the opportunities of tax reform to expand tax base, improve compliance and improve tax administration. And another challenge is the COVID-19 pandemic scenario where um, the government needs to balance between deploying tax relief measures to assist the economy and generating revenues to manage national debt and maintain economic stability in the medium term. Next slide, please. Um, from Thailand's perspective, we have studied all recommendation options as identified in the MTRS draft by IMF. And the Revenue Department has put um, tax administration reform at the forefront as the priority agenda. With globalization and the digital economy, it is imperative that we have to change, otherwise we will be disrupted and we need to have resilience and agility. And COVID-19 further triggers the turning point for digital transformation. So we have done more for this particular area. And uh, to this end, we have embarked what we call the digital drive strategy. And this strategy aims to transform the revenue department into a digital and data-driven organization with innovation culture. And the value of our people is integrity and competency. And the focal point of the tax administration digital reform is on the taxpayer. And in order to serve them better and make tax compliance simple and convenient through new technologies in partnership with the private sector. And this slide sums up 
um, our initiatives for the taxpayer journey from the beginning to the end. Next slide, please. <coughs> and in the tax policy reform area, we would like to make a point that we need to keep up with the new world and address the tax challenges of the digital economy including tax planning by MEs and tax competition. So we have implemented the tax me uh, measures with the international context, uh, that is the transfer pricing law and the e-service, that is the VAT law. And we will introduce the EOI law as EOI will be a powerful tax audit and collection tool for Thailand in the future. Next slide, please. Um, as I said earlier, ADB has kind of extended support to the Ministry of Finance in the area of tax reform. Nevertheless, to build and align all components of MTRS, the Ministry of Finance must involve all stakeholders as one team led by the government. And um, then the government can initiate the necessary tax reforms, in particular, the tax structure and policy measures for revenue sustainability. And those are the points that have been made by Ms. Bayer previously. For the revenue department, ADB can also facilitate knowledge sharing to build tax capacity in these new areas, such as um, practices of taxation of digital economy, use of data analysis tool to detect fraud and non-compliance, and how to use EOI effectively, as well as anti-avoidance provisions, such as the application of the principal purpose test. So that is all for my presentation, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director Sangha Suban. Indeed, as you have said, the pandemic has posed significant challenges to many countries, challenges of a lifetime even, and, uh, and of course for its implications for domestic resource mobilization and the setting out of a medium-term tax strategy. Um, and as you said, the pandemic as well has uh, presented opportunities for digital transformation. And this leads us very nicely into our next session, session three, where our panelists will discuss the topic of digitalization or automation of tax administration. Digitalization or automation is a key lever to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of business processes that enhance revenue administration and tax compliance, as well as enable revenue agencies to improve their offering and engagement with the tax paying public. Allow me to introduce to you our three panelists. First, we have Mr. Aihan Kose. He's the Acting Vice President of the Equitable Growth, Finance and Institutions Practice Group at the World Bank and Director of the EFI Prospects Group. He manages operational policy and advisory engagements across four major areas finance, competitiveness and innovation, macroeconomics, trade and investment, governance and poverty and equity. Our second panelist is Mr. Hichu Moon. He is the Vice Commissioner of the National Tax Service of the Republic of Korea. Prior to this, he served at the NTS Seoul Regional Office as Assistant Commissioner for Taxpayer Compliance Bureau and at the NTS Gwangju Regional Office as Assistant Commissioner for Investigation Bureau. Our third panelist, Mr. Ramesh Kaff, is the Second Commissioner and Chief Information Officer of the Australian Taxation Office. He provides leadership and strategic direction on technology in the ATO and ensures the delivery of technology services to support ATO staff. To kick off this panel discussion, Mr. Kose, could you please share with us your thoughts on the main challenges and opportunities of building a roadmap for the automation or digitalization of tax administration? Mr. Kose, please. Thank you, Yumi. President Massa, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting the World Bank to participate in the ADB's 54th annual meeting. We are honored to be here for the launch of the Asia Pacific Tax Hub. The ADB is one of our most important development partners in the Asia Pacific region. We work together on many important issues and we we'll look forward to working closer on the Tax Hub. As some of you may know, in late March, we organized a two day conference on tax and digital transformation. The purpose was to share international experiences and explore how we can jointly support governments in the region, working closely with other partners 
such as our colleagues at the Australian Tax Office and the OECD. In my brief intervention today, I will share with you some of the lessons we have learned from supporting tax administrations around the world with automation and digital transformation. First, let me talk about the driving forces of digital transformation of taxation systems. Over the last decade, we have seen the cost of digital technologies plummet. Cloud storage now costs 58% less than it did eight years ago. Qualitatively, the tools to develop applications have become more user-friendly and powerful. Big data, meaning data generated from different sources, offers new opportunities and allows us to cross-check information expeditiously. This is important because we know empirically that taxpayers are more likely to report their income accurately when they know that it can be independently reported by third parties. E-commerce is also growing rapidly, fueled by the need for social distancing. In Southeast Asia, e-commerce is projected to grow 24% from 2020 to 2025. While cash remains prevalent, cashless payments are increasing. In Asia, they are particularly prevalent among developing countries. Digital payments can potentially be accessed by tax administration and often leave a digital chain that can be audited. Finally, many governments are successfully leveraging digital technology to simplify procedures and reduce taxpayers' compliance burden. In South Korea, for example, a study by the Korean Institute of Public Finance estimates that digitalization has reduced compliance costs by as much as 19% in the 2011-16 period. The administrative burden can also be reduced within the tax administration as many of the tedious tasks are being automated, leaving more time for officials to engage in higher value activities. You might ask, what lies in the future of tax administrations in light of these developments? We believe that five structural shifts may take place. First, recent decades' efforts to digitize and store large amounts of taxpayer data will end. Instead, this data will be available in encrypted distributed ledgers with tax forming an integral part of the transaction chain. This means that tax administrations will become less visible to the taxpayer and tax data will be captured seamlessly from the ledgers and in real time. Second, robotic process automation will become more intelligent thanks to artificial intelligence and play a large role in risk management and taxpayer services. However, concerns about artificial intelligence bias will likely grow and the risks must be managed. Hence, some tax administrations have begun assigning staff IDs to robots and are making managers responsible for assessing their performance. Third, tax administrations will play a central role in economic policy formulation because they possess detailed data. VAT reporting, for example, provides an overview of economic transactions in the formal economy. This information can feed into forecast models that in turn can use more accurate data about volumes and values of transactions. With all data systematically collected, we can see the potential for tax administrators to become governments future data warehouses. Four, tax administrations become more taxpayer-centric, not only by bringing the services into the house of taxpayers, but also by improving the quality of services. These will encompass not only tax-related services, but also other services where tax data is essential. Already now, some tax administrations provide online question-driven guides to help companies select the appropriate corporate charter and tax regime. 
other jurisdictions allow taxpayers to direct the tax administration to share high-level data to enable banks to conduct credit worthiness assessments. Fifth, if the taxation system becomes a platform, tax administrations will build an ecosystem among tax professionals and major corporate taxpayers to streamline the interface between taxpayers and tax administration by connecting corporate accounting systems with the tax administration's e-filing and e-payment platforms. As more of the traditional compliance work is being automated, tax administrations will shift their focus toward stakeholder management to ensure that the tax system is aligned with taxpayer expectations, needs, and capabilities. So what are the key success factors of digital transformation? Having worked with many governments, we know that digital transformation can be difficult. We have tried to distill our experience in five key success factors. First, successful reforms often require support from a broad coalition of stakeholders in order to implement the necessary legal reforms and to finance the recruits' ICT investments. Second, the transformation strategy must focus on providing value rather than simply digitizing existing procedures. Third, the transformation process must bring about a change in culture from managing processes to managing data. The critical importance of data is highlighted in a statement by one of our international partners. The data department is our largest profit center. Fourth, one high income jurisdiction told us that there were errors in 15% of their taxpayer files, and importantly, that 98% of tax returns could be pre filled with information obtained from just banks. In other words, the right data and data quality matters, not big data. If to be really effective, tax administrations must develop scalable and interoperable systems that can be used across departments and in headquarters, as well as in the field or at home. The siloing of information reduces the availability, ability to develop useful business intelligence. Let me briefly talk about where the World Bank supports tax and digitalization. The bank supports tax and digitalization globally. In Asia and the Pacific, we are currently supporting 21 countries by providing technical assistance and financing tax reforms. The support encompasses a wide variety of efforts, including business process reengineering, BPR, process mapping, simplification, and so on. Around the world, our continued support to countries, especially emerging market developing economies, especially those countries in less developed regions, are going to be critical as we build capacity at the country level. Finally, what instruments do we have available to support governments in the Asia Pacific region. Through our landing operations, we support the financing of hardware, software, integration services, and even civil work for data centers. We have a strong technical assistance capability, working across a broad range of automation issues from support to strategy, develop strengthening data governance, digitizing VAT systems, and so on. Finally, we are pleased to announce the executive program in tax and digital transformation developed with several key partners, including the ADB, MIT, and a range of tax administrations within and outside the region. This is a program aimed at managers in tax administrations and ministries of finance. We will launch it in September in the Asia Pacific region, and we'll be in contact with you in due course. Thank you for your attention, and thank you again for inviting me. Back to you, Hume. Thank you, Mr. Kose, for sharing with us World Bank's perspectives. And thank you very much as well for giving us a compelling narrative on digital adoption for tax administrations. 
And uh, it will be great to see how the key success factors play out in these two countries. Let us now turn to the Republic of Korea and Australia, which are among the leading countries in the world in the digitalization of tax administration. Mr. Moon, may I invite you to first tell us about Republic of Korea's experience in digitalization. Over to you, Mr. Moon. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Moon Hee-chol, uh, Vice Commissioner of the Korean National Tax Service. It's my pleasure to present to you uh, Korea's past, present, and future of automation in tax administration. The presentation will be made in the following order. Let me start with our experience of automation in the tax administration. Uh, NTS progress can be divided into three stages. In 1970, medium-sized computers were introduced. Then in 1997, online processing system TIS was launched. Currently, we are stepping up our effort to enhance automation with operating the following systems. NTS, NTIS, which is an enhanced version of TIS, home tax service, for taxpayers and big data system. First, I will share with you the initial ADP infrastructure development stage. Uh, due to rapid increase in tax data volume, the burden of inputting data increased as well. In 1968, Korea's national ID system was introduced. Real estate registration station system became digitalized. Such digitalization of Korea's public and private sectors allowed for our administration to build a data collection system for individual taxpayer. And this one of the first public institutions to utilize medium-sized computers for collecting tax data. On this basis, in 1997, tax integrated system was launched. It connected tax offices nationwide through a network and centralized the management of all data information. Our administration was able to establish an integrated DB system to manage individual taxpayer, taxpayer data for each tax item. Also, our administration continuously invested resources to foster employee data processing capabilities and to keep data secure from the danger of data leakage. Then in 2000, the law was enacted that allowed tax-related data to be submitted to NTS. Also, home tax made it possible for taxpayers to file and pay for tax in the comfort of their home and home or office. Not only that, cash receipt system, e-tax invoice system, and other major IT systems were sequentially developed. Keeping in pace with the post industrial revolution, innovations and system upgrades were made. In 2015, Neo TIS was developed into one combined system through integration of separate systems. We improved internet service by providing the same level of access as a PC with a mobile phone. Also, NTS introduced the big data system in order to fully utilize various forms of body data. Next, let me introduce to you the French state of Korea's digital tax administration. 
First topic is the service for taxpayers. Taxpayers are able to file all types of tax electronically, especially with free field service on your simple review and click over confirmation button is needed for many taxpayers to file their taxes. My home tax service enables taxpayers to check their personal tax tax information. It offers over 700 types of services that can be accessed to by a mobile device. In addition, taxpayers are able to receive a 24-hour tax consulting service through AI Chapel. Next is increasing efficiency for internal employees. First, High quality service is provided to taxpayers through data driven statistical analysis. Second, tax evasion suspects can automatically be detected using new technology. Also, employees are provided with task navigation system that assists to process data accurately and efficiently. Third, transparency has increased by constructing a systematic processing system. IT contributed to tax administration growth, but also brought many challenges as well. Taxpayers and employees all preferred the old fashioned way of working. As the system grew more massively, complex as well as the possibility of making an error increased as well. In order to solve these problems, NTS improved taxpayer convenience by providing pre-field services. Also, NTS distributed work manuals and provided job training for employees. Now, Comtex is the most utilized government website for Korean citizens and the user satisfaction level is over 80%. Most of our, most of our taxpayers use the internet to deal with their tax issues. As a result, <coughs> the administrative expense has reduced. Lastly, I'll talk about the way forward in Korea's digital tax administration. We will provide AI tax secretary for small businesses who are in a difficult position to receive help from a tax agent. We will provide an optimized computer screen for individual taxpayer. It will personalize notice and payment information by analyzing personal usage pattern. Furthermore, we will work towards full automation of tax service and utilization of the big data system. Also, we are preparing for the new normal era by investing in infrastructure such as the cloud system. This will allow employees to work from home. Korean NTS plans to share our experience, know-how, and roadmap on tax administration automation with other countries. We hope to work together with other countries for the development of tax administration. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Moon, for your presentation, which was very informative in sharing with us your journey in from computerization to integration to further modernization, which includes the impressive use of AI. I would now like to invite second Commissioner Kev to share ATO's experience, please. Commissioner Kev. Thank you very much, Goh Min. Um, President Nasser, um, distinguished colleagues and ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me this evening. I'm very excited to share with you the Australian tax officer's experience in both digitization and the use of data. Um, and, our, and our key premise is very simple which is to make it very easy for people to comply and very difficult for them not to. Um, 
and we see three main objectives from our digitization agenda. The first is uh, improving our taxpayers' experience um, and client satisfaction. The second is reducing the tax gap or maximizing the revenue. And finally, um, improving the automation and productivity of our organization. Um, they're all key elements of our journey. Way too long for us to spend too much time on. So let me briefly, I wanna to talk to you about three very important elements of it. If we can go to the first slide, and that is about data. Um, and let me share with you our journey around the data and the use of data. It began maybe 15 years ago where we started to collect information that we could use to do matching activities. That was step number one. We realized that that was very beneficial, but very uh, um, problematic. So the second step for us was to instill uh, an identifier in the source data so that it made it very clear who the data related to. Um, and again, that was very helpful in terms of uh, uh, helping our clients where um, we had the information and, and they knew about it. Our real um, improvement came when we were able to use that data to provide it and present it back to our clients. Um, and that's where we're at today, where for your individual um, client, um, they can access our service. We present and pre-fill all the information that they need to complete their obligations. They don't have to go and hunt for that information and it makes it a very pleasant and easy experience for them. And so data and the use of that data is a very important part of our journey. But it's not enough about the data. It's about the quality of the data and it's about the use of the data. And so we have very, and, and are implementing very strong governance and data ethics standards, um, not just in terms of how we use the data, but across government um, agencies and government sharing um, instilling those sorts of capabilities um, across, um, excuse me, the, co the Commonwealth. If you can go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about, it, it's entitled Single Touch Payroll, but it's really about natural systems and how we are using um, the, the, the systems of our clients to capture information and make tax a byproduct of their fundamental commercial transactions. The best example for that is our single touch payroll, where we've integrated with well over 300 software developers, where they provide us with the information that the employers would just do as a normal part of their business. And then in, when they do their payroll run, they give us information about the, the tax obligations of the individuals, which we can then use, not just from a compliance perspective, but as I said, from a pre-fill perspective. Um, interestingly, in Australia, the legislation is such that we can then share that information with other agencies, again, reducing the burden for employers to provide multiple data streams to different agencies. Finally, let me talk about a very important part on the next slide, please. And that is our um, digital identity. One of the things that we're all seeing as we progress our digital uh, modernization programs is the need to provide safe, secure, and easy to use credentials for people to interact with us. We've introduced a, uh, a, a whole of government digital identity where we use government databases to verify people's identity, to, uh, to attach their identity to a credential, which they would reuse to access services, thereby making it very safe and secure reducing the incidence of fraud and identity theft, um, and also a very convenient way to um, interact digitally with us. So focusing on security and convenience. Look, my final slide is a very busy one. If I could um, just, it has the five platforms that we have been working through, and it shows our journey, which has been um, at what we've, what we've achieved to date and where we're going. For us, these are the five building platforms that we need to continue to grow and we see continued growth in. Thank you very much for listening to me today. It's been very in, uh, instructive and I'll hand it back to you, Huayman. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Second Commissioner Kev.
for your very uh, useful presentation, for very insightful and uh, helpful in showing everyone ATO's experience in journey. Indeed, as, uh, <coughs> as mentioned in your final point, digital identity will unlock greater value in how tax administrations serve taxpayers and also allow for a more seamless interaction between revenue agencies and their customers. This is also a very key building block in the digital transformation in Tax Administration 3.0. A very forward-looking publication of the OECD's work stream in the Forum of Tax Administration, of which ATO is a key contributor. Since we are on the matter of uh, OECD, this brings us to the final panel. Our final panel for today is on international tax cooperation, a topic which I have personally engaged with for the last 10 years. Our first panelist for this segment actually needs no introduction. He is none other than Mr. Pascal Santamore, Director for the Centre of Tax Policy and Administration of the OECD. Pascal joined the OECD in 2007 as the head of the International Cooperation and Tax Competition Division in the CTPA. He was in fact the first head of the Secretariat of the Global Forum for Transparency and Information Exchange. Pascal was appointed as director of CTPA in 2012. The international tax community has witnessed a number of major global tax initiatives under the auspices of Global Forum and Inclusive Framework all during the course of Pascal's leadership. Our second panelist, whom I also have the pleasure of welcoming, is Ms. Antoinette Tionko, who is the Undersecretary of, for Revenue Operations Group and Corporate Affairs Group of the Department of Finance in Philippines. As the head of the Revenue Operations Group, she oversees the Bureau of Internal Revenue, Bureau of Customs, and the Bureau of Local Government Finance, as well as formulates and implements policies affecting the whole government corporate sector. Ms. Tionko has over 20 years of experience and knowledge in taxation. Let's begin with uh, the session with Pascal. To Pascal, when we compare Asia-Pacific to the other regions, what do you consider to be some of the specific challenges in promoting international tax standards and what might be effective strategies to, uh, to address these challenges? Pascal, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Hui Min. A real pleasure to see you and to see the colleagues and President Massa in particular. Uh, so good evening to you all and thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity um, to speak at this uh, very, very important event. Uh, I would start with um, responding to your question, Hui Min. What is specific to the region? the rate of growth, uh, the uh, promises uh, of further growth, and the fact that as regards um, tax administrations, uh, there is a lot uh, happening, but there is something like a lack of coordination, a lack of a body which would uh, trigger uh, further cooperation among Asian countries. And that's why I'm so happy uh, to support uh, the vision uh, brought by uh, President Massa uh, to, to ADB. Now, let's put that in, in, in perspective. Um, as you've just said, Hue Min, and, and you have participated in all that work for the past uh, 10 years, uh, the uh, world of uh, international tax has changed quite dramatically. Uh, we've moved uh, pre-global financial crisis, uh, pre-2008, from a world of little cooperation, little coordination, essentially bilateral relationship through tax treaties, into a multilateral world where international tax is no longer left to some tax geeks, but is at the core of tax policy. Um, so this change uh, has translated into the building of multilateral instruments like the Multilateral Convention on Mutual Assistance or the Multilateral Instrument for BEPS Implementation, but also it has translated into multilateral cooperation within bodies like the Global Forum on Transparency. You are, who I mean, the chair of the peer review group there, which means uh, very uh, much hands-on uh, cooperation between countries, uh, but also the inclusive framework for BEPS implementation. So we've moved from a world of uh, old-fashioned bilateral instruments and bilateral relationships into a world of multilateral instrument and multilateral cooperation. There is 
a purpose for this. The purpose is to ensure that we have rules which are sustainable and which sustainably support growth, elimination of double taxation, by the fact that countries wouldn't feel like uh, closing down on their own sovereignty. They agree that um, uh, working together means that uh, the rules will be more conducive to a better um, investment uh, environment. And that's what, what we are trying to ensure with uh, the Global Forum and the Inclusive Framework. This echoes the UN agenda of domestic resource mobilization. Previous speakers highlighted <clears throat> the importance of domestic resource mobilization. I think uh, Governor um, uh, Asosan uh, himself made the point on the medium term review uh, strategies, which are a way for ensuring that developing countries can uh, look forward uh, with uh, um, a long term uh, sustainable view and relying uh, more heavily on taxation is a way forward to build better states and uh, to build uh, growth in the in the long term. In that um, um, uh, context, uh, we think that there is a lot to do, in particular in the region. Let me take three examples of what the OECD has developed uh, over the past uh, 10 years uh, in close cooperation so with uh, other Good international job. organizations, uh, like, <laughs> like the IMF, like the World Bank, like the UN, uh, through the Platform for Collaboration on Tax. So um, what, what we are trying to promote is uh, the work on, on capacity building, the assistance on capacity building, uh, uh, we, we, we do uh, on-site uh, assistance throughout the Global Forum to help countries move their legislation so they can benefit from the exchange of information through the BEPS implementation that Minister Asosan uh, highlighted. This is capacity building, which requires now to be more effective in Asia, something like a hub. And that's what President Massa is proposing, that there is a, a regional um, a body which could uh, enhance uh, this work. Second example of the work uh, which is being done is Tax Inspectors Without Borders, which is a niche project uh, developed by the OECD and now run with uh, uh, UNDP. Uh, it's uh, on-site assistance to help countries develop their audit capacities by providing them with expert auditors who do on-site audits, which helps developing countries not only collect more money, but also develop uh, the local capacities on transfer pricing in particular. Let me mention a very recent example in Mongolia, uh, where uh, the Mongolian tax administration has been able uh, to conduct the first international audit on extractive industries. And the outcome is, is quite striking, uh, almost $1 billion of um, um, uh, tax adjustment with a cash payment above uh, uh, 200, uh, I mean, almost $240 million, which have been collected. But more importantly than the money, the transfer of knowledge. Another example uh, which uh, showcases uh, the extremely uh, good and already deep relationship with ADB, um, tax uh, policy starts with data. It starts with a good knowledge of what uh, the tax policy mix is. And uh, that's where we've engaged with ADB. And, and thanks to the support of ADB, we have been able to cover a majority of Asian countries in what we call the revenue statistics, which allows these countries to benchmark with OECD countries, with G20 countries, with almost 110 countries in the world. So uh, with uh, that uh, environment, we can see that uh, domestic resource mobilization is a priority. Domestic resource mobilization is about tax policy, revenue statistics in particular, is about tax administration. And there is a lot to do in the tax administration field. 
for instance, the digitization of tax administration. And there we are considering uh, extending tax inspectors without borders to assist tax administrations in deciding which kind of system they could put in place. Uh, and also international tax, because if you want to uh, mobilize your own resources, you'd better protect yourself from profit shifting and uh, from uh, tax uh, fraud and tax avoidance. To do that, uh, you need the platform for collaboration on tax, you need the bilateral support from ADB itself, from the World Bank, from the IMF, from the OECD, but you also need uh, some benchmark in the region uh, because the issues in the region are different from what they are in Africa, where they have ATAF, or from Latin America, where they have SIAP. Finally, the uh, post-pandemic environment and Let's hope it's going to be post-pandemic uh, as quickly as possible, uh, even though we can see that currently uh, the pandemic is still striking some countries in the region like, uh, like India. But post-pandemic, uh, uh, the challenges uh, will be big uh, in terms of collecting revenue, in terms of ensuring the fairness of the tax system, in terms of ensuring the effectiveness of the tax administration, in terms of addressing new challenges beyond uh, the more traditional challenges as, as VAT or like uh, corporate income tax. I'm thinking of uh, the new um, uh, environmental challenges and the Paris climate, climate goals. So all that uh, fully uh, justifies uh, and more than justifies calls for uh, a, a firm action from ADB in that field. And let me uh, take the last seconds of my intervention to thank you again, uh, Huemi, other panelists, and uh, President Massa for his leadership and his vision on that field. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pascal. Indeed, as you have said, the, both the core and the complexion of international taxation has changed dramatically over the last 10 years. And much of the credit goes to you, Pascal. And uh, it was very nice to hear as well that OECD will work with the ADB, where ADB will provide a bridge, so to speak, from countries in the region to the international discussions that are occurring at the world stage, where the where the increasing emphasis is really moving from just uh, not just bilateral engagement, but to a multilateral engagement. Um, our next panelist, I would like to bring on our next panelist, Under Secretary Tionko. The question for your consideration, uh, Under Secretary Tionko, is why is strengthening international tax cooperation important for the Philippines? Mm -hmm. And how can development partners best support your efforts in this, especially given the additional challenges that have been posed by the pandemic? Over to you. Good evening. Before I begin, um, I would like to thank the Asian Development Bank for the opportunity to discuss with you today the Philippines' experience concerning international tax cooperation and how ADB has continuously supported us in our endeavors. Next slide, please. Okay, to proactively strengthen international tax cooperation of the Philippines with other tax administrations and in effect augment revenue generation, our Secretary of Finance created the International Tax Policy technical working group in 2018. As the TWG's chairperson, it is my privilege to share with you all the significant progress we have made on international tax issues, specifically on tax treaty negotiation, tax transparency, and BEPS. Next. First, in the area of tax treaties, the Philippines began its initiative to update um, the model for double taxation agreements in 2018. Through a series of collaborations with the ADB and the IMF, the Philippines is now on track to successfully design and develop a framework and a model of double taxation agreement in line with the prevailing internationally accepted models. In the same manner, the Philippines is also on target to conclude tax treaties with other ASEAN member states in line with our commitment under the ASEAN Regional Integration Framework. 
We are working closely with our foreign counterparts to ensure that we complete and improve our network of bilateral tax agreements among ASEAN countries in the soonest possible time. Next. Secondly, the Philippines is making significant strides in the area of tra tax transparency. In 2018, while we were assessed and were rated largely compliant in the second round of the EOIR peer reviews, um, we achieved this because of our unwavering commitment to eliminate the gaps in our legal and regulatory frameworks and strengthen the processes set in place for handling EOI requests we receive from our partner countries. While we're happy with the outcome of the reviews that we've had so far, we continue to work to address the remaining recommendations of the Global Forum. Our, on automatic exchange of information, I am pleased to say that the Philippines is currently in the process of putting in place the building blocks for the effective implementation of the standard. Last year, we engaged with um, the Australia for our AEOI pilot project the global, with the Global Forum as well as ADB. So we are currently working on our pilot project with our pilot project partners to identify the roadblocks that hinder us from fully implementing AUI in the Philippines. So part of the project includes experience sharing workshop with our neighbors, and I'm sure um, some of them are present here. This workshop brought together different countries that collaborated and provided the Philippines with much needed support Indeed, with this pilot project, we hope to make our first exchange with Australia and eventually other countries at the soonest possible time. Finally, in the context of BEPS, the Philippines is currently making significant progress in our efforts to assess our readiness to join the inclusive framework. Through technical assistance from IMF in 2018, the Philippines recognize the troubling trends in BEPS and how developing countries like the Philippines are most vulnerable to these practices. Since then, we have looked at how we can protect our revenue base against BEPS. So we are not new to this. Since 2017, we have been identified as a jurisdiction of relevance by the Forum on Harmful Tax Practices because of our regional operating headquarters regime. Here now, just recently, we're happy to note that we have finally passed the necessary legislation to abolish the preferential treatments given to ROHQs. So the regime was successfully assessed last week, uh, actually, as just potentially harmful, but not actually harmful, and later on abolished. So because of this experience, we've become more aware of the benefits of joining the BEPS Inclusive Framework. Here, the ADB is again supporting us by providing expert advice on the requirements of the BEPS minimum standards. Through this support, we have identified several reforms that the Philippines can immediately benefit from. The implementation of the Transparency Framework, uh, BEPS Action 5, um, Prevention of Treaty Abuse, BEPS Action 6, and the Mutual Agreement Procedure, among others. Likewise, we're currently studying the benefits of acceding to the multilateral instrument to implement the reforms. So we believe that this self-assessment exercise will build the foundation necessary to, to meet the minimum standards um, for the BEPS inclusive framework. Again, we're grateful um, for ADB because they're, with this endeavor because they're proactively offering their technical expertise on this. Okay. All of our progress would not have been possible without uh, support um, from ADB uh, to su in supporting our tax reform agenda, both in domestic and international taxation. Because of this, we are looking forward to what the Asia Pacific Tax Hub can do to further strengthen international cooperation in the region. We anticipate that this open and inclusive platform will increase institutional and capacity devo development in the ASEAN region and enhance collaboration and development co and coordination among ASEAN countries. We are confident that through the Asia Pacific Tax Hub, tax policy 
and tax administration bodies in the region can achieve meaningful progress in tax reform, domestic resource mobilization, and international tax cooperation. So thank you again for this opportunity, and I hope you all have a good evening. Thank you, Under Secretary Tiongko, for outlining Philippines' journey towards joining global discussions, global initiatives, global multilateral initiatives. And indeed, um, ADB support has been very important in, for Philippines in coming onto this journey. Our next segment is actually a, a segment for question and answer, questions from the audience. Some questions have already come in, but I, uh, I also invite if uh, participants have additional questions, please indicate your questions on the panel. So far, we have uh, two questions that have been voted as the popular ones. One is addressed specifically to Ms. Catherine Bayer. So Ms. Bayer, can I um, direct the question to you? The question is this. What is the entry point for preparing medium-term revenue strategy? The question is, what is the entry point for preparing medium-term revenue strategy? What is your advice, please? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I believe that one of the ways, one of the entry points uh, is to learn a little bit from uh, the IMF's Fiscal Affair de Affairs Department uh, in coordination with our partners. For example, in many countries, the World Bank is very active, the ADB is very active, is to learn through a workshop what MTRS is all about and to have a dialogue with the country authorities regarding the MTRS framework and the path to defining a medium-term revenue strategy. After such a workshop, then what the IMF has done in many countries, not all, but in many countries, is to conduct a, a, a two-week mission in which there is discussion with Ministry of Finance and the Tax and Customs Administration regarding uh, what the basic outline of a medium-term revenue strategy could be and also uh, what were some of the requirements of um, accompanying types of technical assistance that need to be undertaken to inform the MTRS, including as an example, uh, a, v a, a tax gap study, or for some countries it could be a TADAT to have an assessment of where the tax administration's uh, main strengths and weaknesses are um, and it also could be an assessment of the customs administration's uh, main strengths and weaknesses. And on that basis uh, of uh, pre a prior technical assistance or updated technical assistance, then these recommendations can all feed into designing a medium-term revenue strategy. That could be an entry point. I, I should also say that in some countries, the entry point has been for the country itself to begin a dialogue on what their medium term revenue needs are and what some of the obstacles have been to determine those. In one of the countries I'm thinking about, this has been done through a, a high level conference and a series of con uh, in, with government, the private sector and civil society. And only after that process uh, did IMF and development partners come in to focus on the more uh, technical aspects, if you will, of MTRS. So I, I would say in my experience, there are a few entry points um, on how to begin the process of defining a medium-term revenue strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bayer, for setting out very clearly for the audience, what are the avenues that are available, the technical resources and help, and also the possibility of uh, giving very customized or tailored help to countries who are in need. Thank you very much for that. Our next question is a very popular question because it's got many votes and that question will go to Pascal actually. To Pascal, this is the hottest topic, is the topic of the day, which is what is the best way 
to tax digital transactions within a particular country and across countries. So it is the question of a digital taxation, taxation in the digital economy. What is the best way to tax digital transactions within a particular country and across countries? Over to you, Pascal. Thank you, Hui Min. Indeed, uh, this is uh, the topic of the day. It's been the topic of the day for several days, I would say, <laughs> several years. Uh, the, the, the answer is, is probably less intuitive than one could think, because we think of, of a digitalizing worlds where it would be easy to identify what is digital and what is not digital, and then try to tax what is digital. But actually, as we have been reflecting on this for years, what, what emerges from the reflection is it's the whole economy which is digitalizing. And thinking that you could ring fence a sector is probably a, a false good idea, as we say, uh, and, and would not be conducive to a long-term solution. So what we're trying to do within the inclusive framework, and I'm very glad to hear uh, what uh, the Under Secretary from Philippine, Antoinette Tionko, said about the Philippines joining uh, the inclusive framework with the 139 members. What we're trying to do is to build a long-term multilateral solution. Because if you want to adapt the international tax rules to a digitalized economy and a globalized economy where value creation has changed, where you really rely more on intangible property, where you have a few winners of globalization, you need to have a multilateral solution. Because countries on a unilateral basis cannot do much. And what they can do is to shut down their sovereignty, is to try to uh, act uh, through uh, indirect taxation or, or digital service taxes, which are likely to be discriminatory, are likely to call um, retortion, uh, retaliatory measures uh, by other countries, in particular the US, and that's not conducive to anything, not even to uh, raising uh, more revenue. So what we recommend is a multilateral solution where we would introduce a new nexus to recognize that a country could be taxed on the territory even if it has no physical presence on that territory going beyond the existing permanent establishment and having new allocation of profit rules to recognize more the market than it is today. But to do that, not on one sector, but across sectors. Then you have the question of how manageable it's, uh, it is. Uh, if you try to capture too many companies, you may have serious issues. Uh, if you ring fence, you have problems of complexity uh, of uh, the what we call the business line segmentation. That's why in the new dynamic of the inclusive framework with the recent proposals made by the Biden administration, the idea would be to focus on what we call the winners of globalization, a limited number of companies, but across the board with no sectorial ring fencing, which would, uh, which would allow a more simple solution, which is what developing countries have been asking for. And in the size of that conversation, there is the idea of what we call the Peter two, which would be to put a safety net to limit uh, the uh, race to the bottom on corporate income tax. And I can report uh, that uh, for the next uh, G20 finance ministers meeting in July, we hope that significant progress will be made within the inclusive framework. Thank you very much, Pascal. Indeed, the discussions are still ongoing on taxation of digital economy. And there is a lot of optimism that the inclusive framework, members of the inclusive framework will come to a consensus by summer and uh, by July. Um, and um, well, I would like to come back to Ms. Catherine Bayer, who has a supplementary comment to make. Thank you very much. Uh, Hui Min, I just wanted to congratulate uh, the ADB, uh, President Masa, uh, uh, Governor Aso, on the establishment and introduction of this Asia Pacific Tax Hub and make a remark regarding how important this is and what potential it has for the region. Uh, just how other regional um, tax initiatives have had 
uh, as mentioned in Africa, ATAF in Latin America, SEAT, uh, and that this is really the moment to have a much more um, integrated and intensive exchange and collaboration between the tax administrations or the tax and customs administrations in the case where they're integrated in the region. It's a, it's a fantastic opportunity and it, and it is indeed one of the elements that, that could really help tax administrations uh, strengthen their capacity uh, and also uh, face the challenges of recuperating from this pandemic in a more um, in a more integrated and with more solidarity. So before the end of the, uh, of the event, I just wanted to congratulate you for this initiative and, um, and say how important it is and, and how much potential it has for the region. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bayer, for your very kind words for ADB and the organizers. We've had a very rich discussion on some very uh, weighty topics and we are coming to the close of our webinar. For the closing, I would like to invite President Massa to share his thoughts on what our panelists have discussed and the key role that ADB's Asia-Pacific Tax Hub will play in helping development, uh, developing country members achieve sustainable development goals. President Massa, please. Thank you, Hui Min, and thank you, Catherine, uh, for, for your very kind words. Uh, many thanks to our distinguished panelists and the moderator uh, for, for joining us today, and to the Republic of Korea and Japan for funding the establishment of the Asia Pacific Tax Hub through the EASIA and the Knowledge Partnership Fund and the Domestic Resource Mobilization Trust Fund. Let me highlight that takeaways from our panel discussions before discussing our next steps for the tax hub. First, uh, Ms. Bayer Kassain from IMF highlighted uh, that tailored and holistic reforms in line uh, with the medium term revenue strategy, MTRS, can help governments restore uh, debt sustainability and promote inclusive and sustainable growth. Second, Mr. Mun from National Tax Service of the Republic of Korea and Mr. Kat uh, from Australian Taxation Office indicated uh, that automation is a long, long journey that requires a comprehensive strategy, including enhancement of taxpayer service and high level of commitment. Third, as Pascal from OECD highlighted, uh, cooperation is very much needed bilaterally, multilaterally, and regionally. Increased International tax cooperation ITC within the Asia Pacific region is critical to promoting coordinated and effective responses to international tax challenges and enabling DMCs to reveal fair and effective tax systems for a strong and lasting recovery from the pandemic. Fourth, Sangas Bana from Revenue Department of Thailand, Mr. Coase from the World Bank, and Mr. Tionko from Department of Finance of Philippines highlighted the importance of development support, including lending projects, technical assistance, capacity building, and knowledge sharing. Oh, by the way, let me uh, join Pascal uh, to express my, uh, you know, uh, kind of very uh, good feeling uh, about what we heard from uh, Antoinette, uh, that Philippines is now ready uh, to join our BEPS uh, inclusive framework. Thank you very much. The Asia Pacific Tax Hub will play a key role in these agendas by stimulating regional dialogue and knowledge sharing on needed reforms. In particular, the Tax Hub Secretariat will engage stakeholders in the following ways. First, ADB will cooperate with the IMF as our DMCs formulate country-specific MTRS uh, with activities such as regional workshops organized this May in collaboration with the platform for collaboration on tax and diagnostic tools such as uh, uh, TADAT, uh, which Catherine mentioned. Second, ADB will conduct needs assessments to support the automation of tax administrations in our DMCs. We organized a workshop on digital transformation with the World Bank this March, and we will explore areas for future uh, co collaboration uh, with development partners. Third, ADB will continue uh, leading policy dialogues uh, with the OECD to raise awareness, facilitate membership, and stimulate proactive participation of our DMCs 
in the inclusive framework on BEPS and the Global Forum. Next month, uh, we are co-hosting regional consultations on proposed actions under pillar one and two of the inclusive framework. Fourth, under the tax half, ADB will proactively use our financial instruments such as policy-based and project lending to promote DRM, uh, adop adoption of international tax standards and strengthen technical technology investment by revenue agencies. The web portal launched today will allow for participation and communication of progress in these areas, as we recently approved technical assistance that helps uh, promote knowledge and good practice on uh, raising tax ease in a fair and equitable manner. Last, let me note that I have requested my staff to reach out to the various countries that may wish to learn more about the tax half. We propose establishing a steering committee to bring together key development partners and DMCs willing to actively engage in the tax half. It will work closely together with the Secretariat to lead the operation of the tax half. And we are currently engaged in discussions with countries that would benefit from tax reforms, including Indonesia, Pakistan, and the Philippines, among others. I'd like to conclude this tax webinar by inviting you to join the first high-level conference organized under the Asia Pacific Tax Hub, which will be held by the fourth quarter of this year. This conference will report on progress and discuss next steps on the three building blocks of the tax hub, including details of the operations of the Secretariat and Steering Committee. We look forward to participation from high-level officials of tax policy and administrations. We will reach out to our members and development partners to consult on potential topics of interest and explore how the tax hub could partner with your authorities to provide solutions to many of the DRM and ITC reforms that you are and will be pursuing. So thank you uh, for allowing me the opportunity to present the Asia uh, Pacific Tax Hub to you today. Thank you very much for your cooperation and discussion. Thank you very much, President Massa, for your closing address. On behalf of the organizers, I would also express our deep appreciation to all the panelists for the presentation today. The vision is for Asia Pacific Tax Hub to serve as a catalyst to stimulate strategic dialogue and knowledge sharing in domestic resource mobilization and international tax cooperation among developing member countries and development partners in the region. We look forward to be part of this initiative to make Asia and the Pacific prosperous, inclusive, resilient and sustainable. It's been my utmost pleasure to moderate this seminar. Thank you very much and have a good day or a good night depending on where you are. Thank you.